Everybody, after all the rambling I've been doing lately, it's uh, high time for me to upload another One Step Beyond episode. But um, you'll have to uh, bear a little, well, endure a little compromise because now I'm gonna ramble before every one step beyond episode I'll upload. I'll say a little about it and I'll start with uh, my all time favorite uh, one step beyond episode. And uh, you know, me being a German and me being a huge uh, Star Trek fan, you can probably guess which episode that is. Well, aside from the sacred mushroom, I, I like that episode too, but couldn't get it in good quality. Anyway, no, uh, I'm talking about the uh, uh, the episode with uh, William Shatner uh, playing a uh, German Nazi, no less. Uh, go good Nazi, good Nazi. And that, that's, uh, that's something many Germans don't get. It's like um, that within a group of people, no matter what people they are, be they Germans or Americans or be they, even be they, you know, within a certain party, even be they communists or be they uh, uh, national socialists, um, that in every group of people you have good and bad people, right? And Germans don't really seem to get that. If I say in Germany, oh yeah, there might be a good Nazi, like, of course there were good Nazis, like, you know, Oskar Schindler. He was a Nazi after all, right? So, um... But they can't accept that. Uh, in, in the minds of many Germans, you know, they're all, it's all categories. Jews, Germans, Nazis, uh, you know, they just, after World War II, they just changed it, you know. It's like, oh yeah, uh, in World, uh, you know, uh, during the Third Reich, um, all Jews were evil. And then after that, they uh, kind of... Um, realized, okay, not all Jews are evil. Now, but they, they just changed it around. Now all Jews are suddenly good, but all Nazis are evil. And I even heard some, some Germans uh, say, uh, oh yeah, Nazis, we should put them all in on a train and put them in, into a concentration camp, get rid of them. Seriously, some, some people suggested that. It wasn't a joke. Uh, I, I read in a, um, in a uh, and there was a newspaper, newspaper article. It was a left-winged uh, newspaper. And um, uh, I, I read that um, uh, somebody stabbed a neo-Nazi to death. And... Uh, the article didn't condemn didn't condemn that. On the opposite, they uh, uh, they <laughs> uh, yeah they they, they uh, congratulated that. They 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 said, oh yeah, good thing he did a good deed. They said he get it was a good deed to kill a Nazi. Oh. So and then <sighs> Germans go abroad and uh, <clears throat> you know um, and then of course they get greeted with uh, uh, you know with the right hand up. And they get upset and say, oh, we're not Nazis. No, why do you make fun of us? We're not Nazis. And they, they wonder why people get the impression that they were still Nazis. I mean, yeah, they, sometimes I think they didn't really learn. But of course, you can't generalize that either. Not all Germans didn't learn from history. Just some didn't. And luckily, there were some that did learn from history, like the guy in this episode. Uh, played by William Shatner. Watch it. Great episode. One of my... Yeah, actually, yeah, you can say it is my favorite episode of One Step Beyond. And has a very beautiful message, very, very beautiful story. I can't, I can't say more because I don't want to spoil it. Oh, and while we're still on the subject, uh, this is the only episode where I can mention this. This episode uh, wasn't actually the only time that uh, John Newland directed William Shatner. Um, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Um, John Newland also directed uh, one of my favorite Star Trek episodes, uh, A Rant of Mercy. A Rand of Mercy. Um, 
very good episode. Uh, John Newland uh, uh, directed it, and uh, yeah, and here, here he, he uh, this episode is the first time he directs William. The One Step Beyond episode is the first time he directs William Shatner, and and then when he does. Uh, Star Trek, uh, it's the second time that he he's directing William Shatner. And you can see, of course, that, um, uh, you know, his acting style is uh, is, is very different. Uh, uh, William Shatner's acting style is very different in One Step Beyond than, than it is later in Star Trek. Um, <clears throat> even though it is uh, the same director. And also, and this is, of course, uh, my personal opinion... Um, I think that without One Step Beyond, um, Star Trek would never exist, would never have existed. Because, um, and of course this is a bit complicated and a bit far-fetched, but it's just my personal opinion. Um, One Step Beyond was, was the first show of its kind, you know, with, um, you know, the formula of, one step beyond. I don't need to explain it to you, and um, and you all know that one step beyond, of course, is very similar to the Twilight Zone, but one step beyond came first, and I think that without one step beyond, Ward Serling would never have uh, had the idea to do uh, uh, the Twilight Zone, and um, there was even a conversation. Uh, that took place between Ward Serling and John Newland. When 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 Ward Serling started the Twilight Zone, he went to John Newland and explained to him, "Okay, now I'm gonna do the Twilight Zone. It's gonna be, um, it's basically gonna be like your show, but I'm not gonna rip off your show. Um, I'm, uh, it's it's completely." Um, uh, the difference is it's going to be completely invented. It's it's not going to be based on true stories like your show. So he went to him and explained to him basically that he wasn't going to rip off one step beyond. But uh, be that as it may, it is still very similar. And I think that without one step beyond, Rod Serling would have not had the idea to do the Twilight uh, Zone to begin with. And of course, without the Twilight Zone, and this is a bit far-fetched again, but it's my personal opinion, um... I think without the Twilight Zone, anyway, without One Step Beyond, we wouldn't have the Twilight Zone. And without the Twilight Zone, we wouldn't have Star Trek. Why? Because if you watch the very first episode of Star Trek, the pilot, you realize that it is a complete ripoff. And in this case, it really is a ripoff. If you know the first episode of Star Trek, the pilot of Star Trek, the cage, uh, it's called the cage. Uh, and if you know twi the Twilight Zone, then you know that the cage is a complete ripoff of a certain Twilight Zone episode. It is the exact same story, and it even uses the exact same actors. Um, anyway, <laughs> this was the only place where I could ramble about those things. It's very interesting, and I think... As I said, because of that, without One Step Beyond, we would not have had The Twilight Zone and we would not have had Star Trek. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, One Step Beyond played a at least a small role in William Shatner becoming famous and uh, John Newland uh, also directed what I regard as the best Star Trek episode. So now, here is the episode that uh, started it all. Have you ever been certain your telephone would ring in the next 10 seconds? Or have you ever walked down a strange street and had the feeling that you knew what lay beyond the unturned corner? Yes? Then you've had a brief encounter with the world of the unknown. You are ready for the actual human experience that follows. None of us is ever really prepared for that moment when the thin shell of reality cracks and the world of unreality, the psychic world, is thrust upon us. Serves me right for patronizing you foreigners. It's 
a good thing you people keep a close watch on them. Morning, Carl. The gates, George. Well, at least she didn't call me a hun. Look, why didn't you tell her? Tell her what? That I wasn't a Nazi. I was. The Kaiser didn't use poison gas. That. He did. But look, you can't go on feeling guilty forever. Who has a better right? Should have heard Jolly Hair Gang when he pinned the Iron Cross on my flying jacket. He was most complimentary. Don't let my tea drinking deceive you. Um, where's Lois? At the doctor. Each month she gets bigger, more beautiful. And that bomb is also big and beautiful. Hmm? Uh, then you heard on the BBC, hmm? Huh? You're my BBC. That look on your face. How big is it? It's a 500 pounder, Carl. They found it when they were digging excavations for some new buildings. It's the fuse that has me baffled. Lois would murder you. If you would just look at the fuse, really, it is something that I've never seen in my life before. Look, Carl, please stop looking at me like that, will you? I was there, remember, when you told her once. Never again. Then why did you come? Because I'm frightened. Because you are stubborn. All you English are stubborn. First he drops them. Then he dismantles them. Why? On March 7th, 1943, during Carl Bremer's 28th bombing mission over England, his plane was hit by flak, and he was forced to parachute to Earth seven miles south of London. He was captured by farmers and finally interned in a prisoner of war camp outside the English town of Coventry. It still burns. I can't see three houses that haven't been smashed. How long can these fools hold out? Oh, by November it will be finished. November's not a bad month in Leipzig. I've sunbathed in November. At ease. I have a problem. As you can see, the town was pretty badly hit last night. The civil defense can't even begin to cope with it. What a pity. I realize that I can't force officers to help, but... Uh, Herr Colonel is correct. There must be a thousand people out there still buried in that wreckage. Some of them are still alive. Karl! Ich wusste immer, dass du eine Schwäche hattest. Sogar wenn wir im Training waren. Well, that's the last of them. I hope so. Well, we, we better clear out. One good sneeze and the whole place falls in. Must be a dud. Not for sure. Then why didn't it go off? It could be a Zeitzunder. What's that? A bomb with a delayed action fuse. The Luftwaffe was working on such a bomb. There's a unit of engineers in the next town. We'll send for some sappers. How long? 
How do I know? It's about ten miles each way. Could be an hour. Is that our fault? Now, you... You be brave. Everything will work out. I know that type of bomb. They were starting to give us briefings. I know what to expect. It has a U-15 electrical fuse which doesn't become activated until after the bomb hits the earth. It could go off in two weeks. It could go off in two minutes. Are you people drop the bloody things, not me. I studied the bomb for almost a month. They blindfolded us and made us defuse a dummy bomb so that we would be prepared in case anything went wrong in flight. So? An electric magnet is needed, the kind they use in machine shops. If the fuse is a U-15, it can be made harmless by drawing the pinions into the bearings. You, you're a prisoner of war. You don't have to do this. If I didn't have to, I wouldn't. You'll have to talk sometime. A bomb is so much prettier than seen from the sky. And when it falls, it's so graceful. Like a trapeze artist in a circus. Spinning, spinning, and spinning. And then when it lands, it's like a, a lovely golden flower. Isn't it an ugly monster? Have you ever seen anything so repulsive like a mad dog? But then what harm can a mad dog do when you tear out its teeth? I could spend the rest of my life doing this. Turning every bomb in the world into a piece of junk. Then maybe I wouldn't have to burn in hell after all. Fraulein, if you have a God, and if he loves you, tell him now is the time to prove it. All bombs should be like this. My name is Lois. Lois. First, he dropped them. Then he dismantled them. Why? Now we know why. Now in 1949, here in London, where hundreds of unexploded bombs still remain undiscovered. We know why. Doesn't look too bad. It's farther back, isn't it? Oh, just be careful. Give me a hand. Here. Connect your the microphone up. Yes. And I'll take the bias back. Good. What's happening now? Captain Davis is going to start removing the fuse. Well, what's that for? Hook up to the tape recorder. What's a tape recorder for? Playback at parties? Should the bomb explode, there'd be a record which might tell us what not to do the next time. Baker 2, you received my signals? Hello, George. The equipment checks out. I'm now going to try to work on the timer. Easy now. It's coming out. Coming out very... easily. Slowly. Timer is clear. Good, good. I have the fuse. George Vassis.
What a clumsy clot I am. What do you make of that fuse, Carl? Looks like a multiple. Well, then taking out the first one might make it operational, eh? Who else is dead I can work on it? I can work on it. But your teeth? Well, I can radio battalion for help. No time. No time. Look, doctor, give me a hypo and then get out of here, both of you, will you? Don't ask. Take him back to the control lorry. This is the last time. I mean it. Look, Carl. Come on, snap. This isn't my idea. Carl. From now on, just forget where I live. I've expiated all my sins. And the idea of being a hero nauseates me. And the hero was sweating like a pig. Go. that fuse. There seemed to be another wire there. All right. I have the fuse. Wait a minute. There seems to be a second. This is ridiculous. in and try and ground the trembler properly. Nine. I'm so out of condition. I think I'll rest a moment. Sorry for getting angry at you like that before. But Lois would leave me. I mean it. You know why she went to the doctor today? So that he would talk me out of a ritual which has been observed in our province for only 1,500 years. For as far back as I can remember, every time a baby was born in our village, the father was right there, out walking up and down the village, like an idiot. And instead of the doctor slapping the babies behind, the father breathed the first breath into the mouth of the child. Ich übergebe den Geist des Lebens von denen die vor dir fallen. Von those have come before you. I pass on the breath of life. <laughs> now, does that sound so barbaric? Yes, it does. If I don't do it, don't ask me why. I would worry about that child his whole life through. Now we try again. Dear stubborn, back in half an hour. Stubborn. Now here's something funny. A little chunk of green metal. The wire goes right through it. Now, 
just some oxidation. A little tug. Be careful, Carl. Now the fire's coming out easily. Easily. E Let's go on, Carl. I'm disgusted with you. It's such a beautiful baby. Do you know how many women would give ten years of their life for a baby like that? Well, won't you at least look at him? No. Then what in heaven's name are we supposed to do with him? Don't use heaven's name to me. You need that baby more than he needs you. You need him to hold on to reality. What's so marvelous about reality? Do you believe there is a heaven, Doctor? I do. And someone in heaven cares about us? I believe that too. I won't disillusion you, Doctor, by asking heaven to send back my love. Mrs. Bremer, would you kindly tell your husband that this hospital has certain rules and regulations? What are you talking about? Well, the nursery alarm light went off. I went to the nursery and he had the baby in his arms. Is something wrong? This is my first night and everything was going so well. There's no one out there. But he was there just a moment ago. Well, he couldn't have been. But he said it was his baby. No, let's go he back to your... He was standing there with the baby in his arms. Go back to your duties. Wait. As though he were breathing life into the child. Yes. What did he say? He was saying something tender and soft. But I couldn't understand it. Ich übergeben den Geist des Leben von denen, die die vor waren. It sounded like that. Nurse, you don't know the situation. I order you back to your duties. You're doing this woman irreparable harm. Is she, doctor? Give me my baby. Give me my love. From those who came before you, I pass on the breath of life. Eleven years have gone by, and still Nurse O'Brien of London, England, is absolutely certain that Carl Bremer stood in this nursery five days after his death, holding his infant son in his arms. The doctor in the case, while convinced of her sincerity, is nonetheless certain that such an occurrence is absolutely impossible. Carl's widow, Lois, who now lives in America, refuses to speculate one way or the other. Though there is about her a certain serenity that impresses everyone she meets. Understandably, the incidents surrounding the act of death have contributed much to the literature of psychic phenomena, all of which strains the credulity of the skeptic. And yet, who knows? Certainly as incredible as any case history from the unknown, is the miracle that we can do nothing but accept. Because there it is. There it is. Who in the world, skeptic or believer, could ever begin to explain the phenomenon of life?